Howdy, it's Kyle, taking a look at some island chains in the U.S. Whether they be volcanic in nature, or coastal barrier islands, or a chain of islands in the middle of a river, there are many interesting groupings of islands in the country. And previously, I posted a couple of videos where I talk about interesting individual islands, and I'll leave a link to those in the description. But here, I want to take a look at some groupings of islands, some chains, some archipelagos, if you will. If I'm going to talk about island chains in the U.S., I certainly have to start with the Hawaiian Islands. This is a group of islands in the North Pacific Ocean. They're actually the most isolated islands on Earth. So you look at this map of the Pacific and all of those islands you've heard of, those South Pacific tropical paradises, those are all down in the South Pacific. But the North Pacific has many fewer islands that poke up above the ocean level. But you look at the North Pacific Ocean and there are significantly fewer islands poking up above sea level. This is the grouping of islands you normally see on a map of the state of Hawaii, and there are eight major islands in this group. The island of Hawaii, often referred to as the Big Island, is the largest in the chain, is the most recently formed geologically, and it's the southeasternmost of the chain. It's the largest island in the U.S. It's about the size of Connecticut, and it's also the largest island in the Middle Pacific. The island is known for its active shield volcanoes, including Mount Kilauea, which is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. The island of Oahu is in the middle of the chain. This is the most populous of them all. There's just over 1 million people there, and this is where the capital and largest city, Honolulu, is. However, there is more to the Hawaiian Islands than what you normally see on these maps of the state. It actually extends much farther to the northwest. In fact, the same latitude as Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So you think of Hawaii, you normally think of much farther south tropical, but the northernmost islands where basically nobody lives, however, you are at 26 degrees north. The next group of islands I want to talk about are the Gulf Islands in the Gulf of Mexico, offshore Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. The islands offshore Mississippi are the most protected, including the Gulf Islands Wilderness. There's no development here, and there's access by boat only. Some of the more notable islands off of Mississippi include Ship Island, and this was split into two parts by Hurricane Camille in 1969, and it's called Ship Island because it's the only one with a deep enough bay for ships to anchor. There's another one called Dog Keys Island, or sometimes called the Isle of Caprice, and this is one that's normally underwater, but only a few feet, so it's basically submerged, but at certain times after maybe a big hurricane or something, it might stick out above the ocean level. The islands off of Alabama are not protected as Gulf Islands National Seashore, and you have development on these, including on Dauphin Island and in the Gulf Shores area. And when you get to the Florida section, it's back to the Gulf Islands National Seashore, where a lot of it's protected. But most notably, there's a lot of development on Santa Rosa Island. This is where Pensacola Beach is. There are not many permanent residents there, only a few thousand, but it's a very popular spot for beach tourism. A lot of second homes there. You also have Navarre Beach there, and this whole area has been hit by six major hurricanes in the past 30 years. But almost all of these islands are barrier islands, and they can shift with hurricanes. So how the shape of them are, the elevation of various parts can be a lot different after a major storm. Something else that's interesting is that sometimes you'll get alligators swimming from the mainland to one of these islands across the salt water. So that can be pretty interesting to be out there on the ocean. Maybe you're surfing or just on a jet ski somewhere out there and you see an alligator out there in the open salt water. Next, I'm going up to the Midwest and Wisconsin with the Apostle Islands. This is a grouping of 22 islands off the north shore of Wisconsin in the western end of Lake Superior. 21 of those islands are part of the Apostle Islands National Lake Shore. One is a regular kind of island with development on it. It's a grouping of islands that are all fairly close to each other and easily accessible from the mainland by boat. Madeline Island at the south end is the only one that's developed. There's a town there called La Pointe, and it's also the largest island of the Apostles group. But even on Madeline Island, you still have some areas that are protected, including Big Bay State Park, a nice area for caves and bluffs. For the ones that are part of the National Park Service, you do have wild camping on the islands, and you can paddle between them in a kayak. There are also island cruises that go around the islands, although none of them stop at any of them. A handful of these have very limited National Park Service facilities, and there are eight lighthouses between the grouping. Most of these lighthouses are protected as historic structures. Most were built in the 19th century, including the really cool one on Sand Island. On the island called Outer Island, which is the outermost one, there's an abandoned logging and furniture operation there. It's almost like a company town ghost town, but there's also a nice lighthouse on the island. 
Next, I'm headed to the West Coast and the Farallon Islands, which are located off the coast of Northern California, about 30 miles west of San Francisco. The Farallons are a group of three exposed volcanic outcrops, including another one that's about 10 feet underwater but doesn't count as an island. The three exposed islands are simply referred to as North, Middle, and South Farallon. South is by far the largest, and the high point on it is 358 feet, which is a pretty high point for a small area island. Most of the islands are protected as Farallon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, but Southeast Farallon Island has a research facility on there for marine biologists with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. These islands are a prime nesting spot for many birds, but also many sea mammals. It's the largest seabird flyover and nesting site off an area in the contiguous U.S. Up until 1970, prior to the islands being protected, the area was used as a nuclear waste dump site, including a nuclear ship being scuttled in the area. It became a National Wildlife Refuge in 1969 and a Marine Sanctuary in 1981. The San Andreas Fault goes just east of these islands, so the Farallons are on a different tectonic plate as the contiguous U.S. Now heading to the east coast, I'm going to North Carolina and the Outer Banks. This is a long chain of barrier islands that goes for about 200 miles. As you can see, they're very long and narrow, and they're virtually flat, with almost all the terrain being under 2 meters on the entire island. Much of these islands are protected as Cape Hatteras National Seashore and there's no development, but there are also some small towns with some development, including some areas with many beach homes. There are multiple bridges that link mainland North Carolina to the Outer Banks. You can drive to the Outer Banks and then basically drive all the way down them as well. There are a couple of spots where there are car ferries, and when you cross by ferry, it still stays the state highway number, including this one here, Highway 12. Ocracoke Island, which has Highway 12 going through it, is not accessible by road. But just like the barrier islands off of Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, the shape and size of these can really be affected by a major hurricane. For example, Pea Island and Hatteras Island are sometimes joined as one. Between 1945 and 2011, there was a land bridge between the two, but then Hurricane Irene blew that land bridge away, but since then there's been other storms and other systems go through there, and now Pea Island and Hatteras Island are once again joined as one island. And to go along with that, Bodie Island is not actually an island, it's now connected to the mainland, so it's now a peninsula. Because these islands are so narrow, you have a lot of strong winds, and part of these outer banks is the area known as Kitty Hawk, and this is where the Wright brothers had their first flight in 1903. So I really do like the Outer Banks. I think they're some of the best beaches on the East Coast, so do check them out if you haven't. Heading up north, I'm now going to the Thousand Island chains between New York and Ontario. This is a chain of over 1,800 islands located in the St. Lawrence River between Lake Ontario and the sea. The St. Lawrence River is the international border, and the largest cluster of these islands are over a 50-mile stretch. Some of these islands are protected as Thousand Island Park in New York, and some of the other islands have protected portions of it, even though there might be some development on it. The largest in the group is Wolf Island. This is on the Ontario side. It's about 48 square miles. It's a very popular summer resort. Whereas this little island here is called Just Room Enough Island. This little thing is privately owned. It's about 3,200 square feet. A lot of folks might not call this an island, but there is just room enough. Another one of the largest ones is Grindstone Island. There's a nice spot called Canoe Picnic Point State Park you can only reach by paddling. Deer Island is privately owned by the Yale University Secret Society Skull and Bones. Yeah, there's nothing sketchy about that. You do have some historical forts here with British and French fighting over some of this land a few centuries ago. You got some old historic yacht houses here that look really cool. Another spot called Bolt Castle on one of the islands. So Thousand Islands, there are more than 1,000, but many of them are just small rock outcrops and ones about the size of that Just Room Enough Island. Other ones are fairly similar to that Just Room Enough Island to where it's bigger, but still just has one house on it. So a lot of small private islands to get away from societies. So if you want your own piece of paradise in a river, buy one of the Thousand Islands. Heading back down to the Gulf of Mexico, I'm going to the Dry Tortugas, which are the westernmost islands of the Florida Keys chain. So you think of the Florida Keys, normally it's this chain right here with Key West being the westernmost one, right? But actually the Dry Tortugas are part of that same chain geologically, but they're 70 miles west of Key West. 
most of this area is protected as Dry Tortugas National Park, and it's a very important area for marine wildlife. And there's a lot of really interesting physical features as well. From a geologic perspective, it's the same limestone as you find in mainland Florida and the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. There's lots of underwater caves here. This spot is great for cave diving. And those are the major reasons why it was made a national park in 1935. There are between 7 and 11 islands in this far western area of the Keys, depending on just how many storms have moved what around. The largest island in the group is Loggerhead Key at about 65 acres, but three of the islands are smaller than two acres. And just like the ones in the northern gulf, some of these islands can change a lot. But you can see from these images of this island, it's taken at different times, just how much things have changed. Sometimes it's connected to the next one, sometimes it's not. So look at the Google Maps version of these. This is the regular road one. You can see they're not connected. But then you look at the one that's the satellite image, and at the time the image was taken, they were connected. But because the only way to reach these islands is by boat or by small seaplane, this is one of the lesser visited national parks in the country. Heading back to California, except this time off the coast of Southern California, I'm going to the Channel Islands. It's a grouping of eight islands not too far from the coast, five of which are Channel Islands National Park, two are used by the U.S. Navy, and one has development on it. They range in size, with Santa Cruz being the largest at about 95 square miles, and Anacapa and Santa Barbara Islands only being about one square mile. But these all have very steep topography, so Santa Cruz Island at 95 square miles, the highest point is 2,400 feet, which is Devil's Peak. And Anacapa Island at only one square mile, the high point is 930 feet. But these are really good islands for seeing some wilderness pretty close to major population centers. All the ones that are in the National Park have campsites and there's plenty of trails there. Santa Cruz being the largest one has the most outdoors options. If you have a sea kayak, you can paddle to one of over a hundred caves off the island. The two that are used for the U.S. Navy are San Clemente and San Nicolas. One is used for weapon testing and includes the only ship to shore firing range in the U.S. The other is used as a major training facility for elite units including the SEALs. And there's even a fake town there to do simulated urban operations. The one island in the chain that has development is Santa Catalina Island, usually just referred to as Catalina. The original development came in the early 20th century with William Wrigley of the gum fame being the one that was mainly behind it. Most of what you see on the island was built because of him, but eventually the family deeded the island to the Catalina Island Conservancy. So most of it is protected from further development, but you do again have about 4,000 people there, including many gated communities and private beaches. Heading back to New York, but this time literally in the middle of the city, we're going to Gateway National Recreation Area. So you can see here, it's right between Brooklyn and Queens. JFK Airport is literally one of the edges of it. So you have the National Recreation Area, but part of it is also Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. So it is nice that much of it is protected because you do have some development. You have Cross Bay Boulevard and Bridge, and there's also some small village development in the middle of it. It's interesting how the recreation area was created as a protected spot in 1972, right in the middle of the urban renewal craze in some of these northeastern cities. But as you might expect with the wetlands there, it's a major area for migratory birds. But you also have some nice beaches. You have some with sand dunes. There are a couple with ponds on the islands. And you have some that are even slightly wooded. A good park within this protected area is Sunset Cove Park. And there are some nice spots you can get to that are relatively difficult to get to for most people. And this is a really cool spot to have right there in the city because you have all that development around you. But with a really short boat ride, you can get to some spot that most people aren't ever going to go to. And you have some nice seclusion right there in the middle of the city. All right, I started in Hawaii. I'm going to end with Alaska and the Aleutian Islands. This is that grouping of islands that juts out from the southwest peninsula of Alaska. There are 69 total islands, of which 14 are large and 55 are much smaller. The Aleutian Islands take their names from the Aleut people, which are the indigenous group in the region. The first Europeans to reach these islands were the Russians, who were doing mainly fur trading at the time. The vast majority of the island chain are part of the U.S. state of Alaska, but some of the westernmost ones are part of Russia. There is a bit of a geographic oddity as the 180 degree line of longitude goes down the middle of the Aleutian Islands. So as a result, the westernmost islands in the chain are actually in the eastern hemisphere. So 
Many people will say that the easternmost islands of the chains are just over the 180 degree line are actually the easternmost parts of the U.S. So there is a little bit of a debate, but really nobody cares. Because of these islands' proximity to Russia, they were very strategic spots during the main Cold War of the late 20th century. You had the ADAC naval base, which was decommissioned in 1997, and the U.S. Coast Guard was using some of these islands for a listening post until 2010. And being located where they are, there are many active volcanoes and lots of seismic activity on these islands, frequent earthquakes. And these islands effectively outline the border between the Pacific and the North American tectonic plates. The largest town in the chain is called Unalaska, with about 4,300 people. You also have Dutch Harbor, which is the largest seafood fishery port by volume in the U.S. It specializes in king crab. So, the Aleutians, one of just many interesting island chains in the U.S. So that was my look at a handful of island chains in the U.S. And there's certainly no shortage of these, whether they be in the U.S. or international. And I may come back to this topic later on. But if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography from a nerd. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special thanks to my superior patrons for their support. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. As always, thank you very much.